Hi, my name is Sarah Goodwin, and I'm here today with Lewis Reithart, who's a professor of neuroscience at the University of California, San Francisco. And Lou is a very successful neuroscientist, and he's also known throughout the world as the first American to summit K2, the first American to summit both K2 and Everest. And on his expedition to Everest, he led a team that were the first to ascend and summit Everest from its east side, and this route has never been repeated. I thought we'd start with, how, how did you begin climbing? Well, I, I should say, as a kid, I was very athletic, and I think that's true of many scientists. I mean, they don't, they aren't very intellectual as children, particularly if you're a boy. And uh, my family went on camping trips. I mean, I'd say the mountains were at least the most exciting thing in my life in some ways, and so it was natural to want to explore in, in the Sierras, which are a wonderful place to explore, and this included trying to get to the tops of the peaks and stuff, and of course, even these things like walks when you're young seem like a huge adventure, and so I just loved it, and so then it went on from there, basically. What got you interested in science? Well, I, I got interested. I went to Harvard as an undergraduate, and I really thought I was going to go into history or something, and I was impressed. I mean, at that point, if you, uh, there were two things. I mean, one, I did take a biology course that Jim Watson taught, and it was a time when basically the whole concept of DNA to RNA to protein was just being discovered, the triplet code and so on. And so it was incredibly exciting, you know, and compared to reading endless thick books on Russian history, the czars or whatever. And so that was uh, a very strong motivating factor. What was your first big expedition? Well, the first one was to Mount McKinley, actually, which I'd say was, it was purely by chance. A friend knew a friend. and. I never even thought about this, uh, and I just say that Mount McKinley is an absolutely magical experience. Uh, the, we were there in the early summer. The, uh, the, it's very glaciated. You're on these huge glaciers. The sun, while well, it goes down, the light never disappears, and so you get this, this spectacular light on the, on the snow, purples, oranges, greens, that you, can't, you don't see anywhere else, I think, in the world except in the high Arctic. And so. Uh, you know, we were successful, though we spent 12 days in a storm in we, and, and a lot of cold and very little food. Grad school, you went on the expedition to Mount McKinley. What about when you were doing your postdoctoral research? Well, my postdoc, actually, I did a, and I should say, I, uh, these expeditions, uh, I, I did two expeditions. One was an expedition to Dalagiri, and this was just after I finished a Jane Coffin's Child's Fellowship. It was our second expedition to Dalagiri and, and one we were successful in. And then I did another expedition from when I uh, was at Harvard between a postdoc with Paul Patterson and Torsten Weasel where I went to Nanda Devi in India. You took a lot of challenging routes up some of these mountains. Why did you decide to take different and new routes? Well, I mean, I think it's like science. I mean, there's no point in doing something that has been done before, actually. I mean, it's, and it's particularly hard to justify taking all that time just to re repeat a route. I think that, you know, just like in science, you try to do something new. You try to do something that's not in other people's footsteps. So I have to say, in terms of the beauty, the interactions with the people, I mean, much of what you get from these expeditions doesn't involve climbing at all. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about your expedition to K2. So when did it happen and uh, how did you prepare yourself to go on this trip? Well, the K2 expedition was in 1978. It was something I should say that every American climber would have given their uh, right arm to go on. There had been this history. The Americans had tried K2 in 1938, uh, 1939, where they had a very tragic accident, 1953, where they had this heroic rescue of Art Gilkey. Then the Italians had come in and snuck the mountain in 1954 with Campagnoli and uh, Lacadelli, and it actually had not been climbed again until it was climbed by a massive Japanese expedition the year before we went. And so when I got the chance to go, which I think was because I'd been on the Nanda Devi expedition, which was actually where we did a quite difficult route. I should say it's, it's an extraordinarily long approach. It's more than a two-week hike to base camp. And so you have a lot of time to get into shape, actually. So when you go on these expeditions, do you expect to summit? K2 trip, I had uh, 
one child at this point, another on the way. I went there with being very, very cautious, actually, and I did not expect to go very high on the mountain. And so the summits were very far from my mind. And in the end, uh, this trip, it turned out it was a trip we had gotten the permit really not at the ideal time of year because it involved some political influence of Senator Ted Kennedy with Zulfakar Ali Bhutto, who gave us the permit, but they'd already given the British a permit for earlier in the year, and so we had to show up late. And so we ended up in really what was the monsoon system in the summer in Pakistan, where we spent 68 days above our base camp and I'd say at the end, it was sort of, it wasn't survival of the fittest, it was whoever was left standing. And so there were four of us that were left standing. Or, and so we had, uh, we got very lucky at the end that we got a break in the weather and were able to do it, but it was far from sure thing. So once you reached the top of K2 and started to come down, um, there were some challenging moments. Could you talk a little bit about that? It was very late in the day, five in the afternoon. I was extremely cold because I didn't have oxygen. I felt I had to leave. My partner was on oxygen and he had a park and it was much warmer and he wanted to take panoramas. And so in the end, since we had not used ropes, I left before he did. And we made very different decisions that I didn't have bivouac gear and he had bivouac gear. And so I uh, came down through the difficult stuff and managed to find the tent around eight or nine at night and he decided about 700 feet below the summit that he would, it would be dark before he got to the difficult part. And so he just made the decision to bivouac and I think it went okay for a while because he had a blue A stove, but then he lost the, in changing the cartouches, he lost the little gasket and he was smart enough, uh, he was inside a bivouac sack to realize he couldn't restart a stove without a gasket or he'd just have an explosion. And so he uh, had a cold night, but came down himself. Uh, the next, we had two people that had come over uh, to join us, and they climbed the mountain the next day in actually much better style. And, uh, and they came down, but that night, uh, when they were, we were all cooking water, and they did make the m mistake of changing uh, actually one stove while they had another stove lit in the tent. So they had a huge explosion, which, we also, it's sort of like the Yosemite firefall. They're kicking all their tent, all their sleeping bag stuff, and you see all this flaming stuff going down the slope, and you hope there are no boots or something in this. And so then they said, well, they had to come over and spend the night with us, which we did, but it meant we couldn't cook anything. And so the next day, we were very dehydrated. Uh, two of us, it turned out, were, uh, two of the people were, were very tired. And so all we did, we got down one camp below, uh, where we had uh, a little food, no gas, and uh, nothing to sleep on except we slept on top of ropes, basically. Then we had another uh, long day to where we actually met some other people on the expedition where a big storm came in. And I should say, if we'd been stuck high in the mountain, that we would have been in very difficult shape just because we had no provisions at all. And at the bottom, it turned out that my partner, Jim Wickwire, who'd uh, gone to the summit and uh, walked down, but he'd progressively gotten weaker and sicker. And so at the bottom, it was clear that uh, he really needed to be evacuated. We tried to arrange a helicopter evacuation, but the Pakistani helicopters would not go that high. So our porters, uh, who were Balti porters, uh, uh, so the Shia Muslim, had come in to take the expedition out, they'd had to spend an extra day without food uh, because we were slow and because of Wickwire's uh, condition. And they carried him out over the whole length of the glacier, about 60 miles, uh, really heroically, I think, saving his life. And uh, so it was one of the most, I'd say, memorable moments in the mountains for me to have people that we did not have particularly close relationships before we came, but to see how this sort of human need absolutely brought the best out of them. Because if for some reason my partner, if Jim had not lived, I mean, it just would have destroyed our whole sense of what the expedition was worth. And so we were, uh, we were and I think, continue to be profoundly grateful to them for what they did. So you summited Everest in 1983. What was it like to be on the top of that mountain? 
It was wonderful. I mean, it was a terrific experience. We were there in wonderful weather. I mean, we were there in mid, not too late in the, uh, in the day, so we spent quite a long time there, I think at least an hour. It was like a warm Sierra snow day in the winter. So you pioneered this new route up Everest while you were an assistant professor at UCSF. Um, how did you balance these two major endeavors? I had not thought of doing anything after K2, but then uh, Diane Feinstein uh, went to China in 1979 to Shanghai to set up a sister city agreement. It was the very first time when the Chinese, in a sense, were opening up to the, at least the Western world. And so her husband, Richard Blum, uh, asked for an Everest permit and got it. And I did not know either of them at the time, but they contacted me afterwards. I think that. Uh, you know, Dick is a very successful investment banker, and he loves the the Himalayas. He'd done a lot of trekking in uh, in Nepal, but he hadn't really ever tried to do anything like this. And so it seemed like just a spectacular opportunity. I mean, people had not been in Tibet, at least Americans had not been in Tibet since 1950. And there had not been uh, serious expeditions to Tibet uh, since the 1930s, the British expeditions to Everest in the 1930s. And so it was the wide open, it, it, was, it had every element of adventure in it. Why was the route up the east face of Mount Everest so technically challenging? Oh, because, uh, well, it had a 4,000, 4,500 foot buttress at the bottom of it. And uh, the first, that probably 1,500 feet was quite steep, but very good rock. Then you had a, a very long ridge, which when we went in 1981 was very heavily corniced, and so this is very much like some of the uh, Peruvian ridges that you have. Then we had an ice gully that we had to climb up, which we called uh, the, the uh, bowling alley, and this was, of course, because rocks did come down it. And we set up a camp at the top, which we called Pin Setter. And then we had about an 800 foot, largely overhanging face, which was generally quite good rock, but it was an altitude uh, between 20 and 21,000 feet. So it did melt out in the summer. And what this meant is that, uh, because there was water freezing and thawing that, um, in fact, there were very large hunks of rock that could come out. and. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, we, w w we used many, many different ropes on this face simply because we were worried that rocks would cut any one of them. And we didn't want to have more than a couple of people on the face at a given time because we were worried about somebody above uh, kicking down a rock on, on somebody below. And so then up above, I'd say, well, there was a very, again, a sort of a 700, 800 foot run out of fairly steep ice, but pretty straightforward ice. It wasn't, and from then on, it was probably the easiest uh, climb up the mountain. But, but the, it was this bottom uh, route, part of the route below 21,500 feet that was especially challenging. And I should say that when we started it, you couldn't really say, see your way to the end of it. So when you see something like that, is it intimidating or? It's profound, it's hugely intimidating. I mean, you say, how can you do this? But it's not so different from science, where if you think about it, I mean, if you want to solve telomeres or something, I mean, uh, you have, <clears throat> you don't even know what you have to know to solve the problem in many cases, yeah. And so you just take it step at a time and hope for the, use your best judgment and hope for the best, yeah. So what do you think made you such a good mountaineer? I think it's pure chance. I, I should say, I think the, uh, you know, it does pay to think about things. And many of the, many mountaineers that I know are, are, have excelled in sort of professional lives. I mean, Henry Kendall, for example, won a Nobel Prize in physics and was a wonderful climber in Yosemite and also a wonderful mountain photographer. Uh, there are a number, there are many, many physicists in the mountaineering. And, stuff. and so it's clear that scientists, sort of like this, and I think part of the reason they like it is because it involves the sort of same metals trying to solve problems that actually in a much shorter time span often than in science. Both mountain climbing and science are very mentally challenging with uncertain outcomes. Um, do you see a relationship between the two, and do you think the similarities between the two <coughs> helped you be successful in each one? Well, I think, you know, there are there's similarities in the sense that success is, is very uncertain. I should say the 
consequences in mountaineering of losing a partner are or somebody are much more serious than having a study section destroy your grant, not like your grant. And uh, again, that the it provided some balance to me in the sense that I knew whatever happened to me in science, whether I was first to discover something or second to discover something, got a paper into Cell or got it into some lower journal, that these consequences were just simply didn't have the same consequences even on my, my uh, sense of being as a human being or, or, or self-worth or, or whatever as what had happened in the mountains, as I say. So, so because the mountaineering is so much more intense, I, I think you're much more, I, I should say the friends, even f people that I had profound differences with on, at some point on these expeditions, I should say we have bonds that uh, I think it's very hard to equal in science.